I'm Rob Lucuri, a senior editor at Gold Derby here with Stephen Knight, who wrote the screenplay for Pablo Lorraine's Spencer. Stephen, first of all, I'm fascinated by the way this movie is set up. It's introduced on screen as a fable from a true tragedy, and it puts the audience on notice that the film is not a biopic um, about the people's princess as such. It's instead a fictionalised rendering of a private moment in her life. Um, and I'm just really interested to know why it was decided to frame the movie in this way. I mean, from the beginning, um, I was very conscious of the, the pitfalls uh, involved in a project like this and didn't really didn't want to do a biopic because, first of all, it's been done, but also it a biopic presents you with its own beginning, middle and end, which, which really limits you as to what you can do. And also, I think Diana was probably one of the most observed human beings in human history. You know, people always looked at her, took photographs of her, filmed her. And what I wanted to try and do was get inside her head and observe from her point of view the world around her. So it's sort of reversing what normally would happen. And I think once you do that, and, and bearing in mind she wasn't well at the time, once you're into someone's head and their perception, their imagination, it gives you permission, I think, to start to be something other than totally realistic. Yeah. So what did you have to do to prepare for or to, to get your head in the space to allow you to write this screenplay about this particular period in her life? Well, for, I mean, fortunately, I hadn't, hadn't seen any of the, the movies or documentaries, um, and I didn't, I'm glad I didn't, and I d deliberately didn't watch them for this and didn't read any of the books or any... Um, you know, history tends to take events, turn them into a pattern as if everything that happened was eventually inevitable, which we all know reality is chaos and madness and all yeah. kinds of possibilities. And I wanted to capture that. So I concentrated solely on talking to people who had been with her at this particular time, on this particular Christmas, people who were working, because it very quickly became apparent to me that she was herself only with staff. And so the testimony of staff gave you access to the real person. And as I say, reality being crazy and chaotic and random, I wanted those real things that really happened and use those as stepping stones. So they're like the nails that hold it up. And in between, you can dance in, in between and use what you imagine to be Diana's imagination to take you and how did she experience those events. And it turned out that reality gave me lots of gifts, including yeah. things like the weighing machine, which, you know, as a writer, you would never dare to invent. But someone with her condition arrives for Christmas and is weighed and is told that she needs to put three pounds on to prove she's enjoyed Christmas. You wouldn't dare make that up because it's too appropriate or inappropriate. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what I did. So I, I deliberately avoided other depictions of her or other people's opinion of what happened to her in her life. Um, quite apart from who, who she is, and because we all, as you mentioned, kind of touched on earlier, a lot of, a lot of people, like they have this ownership over her, over her legacy, over what she represents. But if we put that aside, you're also writing a film about a woman who is suffocated, um, oppressed, and desperate to break from this so-called fairy tale that looks lovely on the surface, but is actually quite horrifying on the inside. What, what was going through your mind when you were writing that aspect? I mean, we're both middle-aged, you know, white blokes, Australian, English. How do you write for that kind of thing? Okay. Um, the... the First of all, the framework of it, of what I did want to be a fairy story because she was a princess. So and I think all fairy stories are horror stories with happy endings. They're, they're all pretty horrific. Children getting eaten and people being captured in castles. Yeah. And so this fairy story I wanted to tell with the knowledge that it should be quite scary uh, because we're in her head and she's, she's quite scared. As for method of doing that, um, as I say... For me, this is only for me. It's the only the, it's the way I work. And, you know, I, I think years ago, I used to sort of pretend I'd done loads of research and pretend that I'd gone into this and gone into that. But now, I mean, 
completely candidly when I sit down at a keyboard, I just try to switch off whatever conscious mind is at work and just let it happen and let the fingers write it, if you see what I mean, and yeah. then read it back, read it back and see what happens. So this happens particularly through dialogue rather than event. Um, and just hear the characters talking as much as you can. And then, I mean, it's just the way I do it. It's not good for your fingers because you write so much and then you have to get rid of so much. Yeah. So it's not, you know, it's not economical. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's the, it's pretty much now the only way I can do it. And I compare it to if you play, an, if anybody plays an instrument and then you think about what you're doing, it stops. Yeah. Whereas if you just let it go, it will happen. And any, um, you know, blame or credit that comes from anything that I do, I sort of feel comes from somewhere else. Do you know what I mean? It's not yeah. like I've sat down and thought, I'm going to do it like this and I'm going to write that. I tend to think about the, whatever it is and then try, if possible, to just let it go. So, yeah, okay. yes. Sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 that's it. That's, yeah, yeah I, I've heard this actually from a few people, um, composers, songwriters and screenwriters in particular, the artistic process of just kind of uh, letting it kind of just come out of you organically and yeah. then you compare it back, chisel it back later. That's fascinating. Um, and then, of course, you you decided to set it at Sandringham at this particular juncture in her life when she is desperate and eventually emancipates herself from the shackles of this royal family that don't come off quite well in the film. Why did you decide to um, set it at that particular point in her life? Yeah, I, the, the initially speaking to because I, I sort of knew a couple of people who knew her uh, before this happened. Um, and, uh, you know, she, she operated in an area of London that I know quite well around Kensington and stuff. And talking to those people, I started to home in by luck as well, not design, by luck finding out that there was a particular Christmas when a decision was made, which is always a good place to be if you're writing that. And it was Christmas, which means that, you know, a lot of us can relate to being stuck with family we don't want to be with during a religious festival or an annual festival. So it makes it relatable. Um, and the fact of Christmas, if you, as a writer, Christmas gives you a Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, Boxing Day, which is first act, second act, third act, which is neat. So I always think if you want to be sort of surreal and, and odd, you need some very straightforward building blocks to make sure that it's sort of intelligible. And I thought Christmas was that. And the fact is, she was at, at Sandringham over these three days, a decision was made and the people that I spoke to were there to, to observe it. And, you know, it's just such a, um, yeah, people write about um, Mary Queen of Scots and Elizabeth I and all they have to go on is these faded parchments that people wrote sometimes a long time after to actually talk to people who knew the person, knew the actual princess uh, is a real gift. And so that's, that's what I try to use as much as possible. I'm so, I'm so glad you brought that up because um, in the first 20 minutes of the film, that <coughs> sent, that hit in the stomach, that dread that many of us, I included, feel at certain family occasions where I really don't want to be there. Um, I felt that so viscerally. A lot of that obviously has to do with Pablo, Sebastian and, um, and everybody, all the crew and, and particularly Kristen's beautiful work. But you're writing this suffocating uh, environment for her. The, the walls feel like they're closing in. There's a dining room scene where she's devouring these pearls. Um, did that stuff come to you quickly? Uh, that that's suffocating. It's so hard for me to pinpoint how 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 to even describe it. What what are your thoughts on that aspect of the film? Um, yeah, I, again, as the process I've described it, is just feeling that suffocation, having whatever reference oneself has to that situation. Often I think um, these things are most effective if, if you imagine yourself as a child in that situation. Because I think when you're a child, you really experience everything in a heightened way, in a dreamlike way, and your memory of it as a child. So to put yourself in that position almost as if you're a child in that scary position, and then start to write. And in terms of the building, I mean, what I was told about Sandringham was that it's quite, it is quite suffocating. And I wanted the idea that, at any moment, 
any part of the wall could be a door and the door could open and someone could say, you're, you're late or you're required at so-and-so. So it's almost like the building itself is giving you the instructions that as you walk down a corridor, you're walking down that as a consequence of being instructed to do it and that she's being told what to do all the time. The point being, here's someone who one would imagine has enormous power. Yeah. For example, has complete authority over staff, you would think, when in fact it's the opposite, because what the staff are doing is delivering instruction from the bigger entity. And the bigger entity isn't even the Queen and Prince Charles. The bigger entity is something a thousand years old. It's yeah. this machine. It's this organism, if you like, that, yeah. that cannot change. If it changes, it's, it's destroyed. So it must stay yeah. the same. And so you can't have any room to move and just to get that idea that everything is narrow and that there are no options apart from the, the door that suddenly opens. Yeah, that whole concept of the monarchy, in fact, um, it, I, it really reminded me that, you know, through looking at the film through my own lens, it confirmed my unease with the monarchy as an institution, and as a machine, as a, as a thing, uh, uh, it's, it, and how oppressive it, it must be for the people that are within it. Um, and we're reminded about how the monarchy are like a they. They can hear everything. They're watching, you know, um, those signs in the downstairs kitchen. Um, that's fascinating to me. I just wonder, like, what, what are your personal thoughts on the monarchy and did that inform at all how you wrote the screenplay? No, I, I tried as I, so I tried not to invite my conscious mind yeah. and opinions to the to the keyboard at all, um, because I think that just gets in the way. So I, I really wasn't trying to make a point that was anti-monarchy because I'm not antagonist towards a monarchy at all. Because I don't think that it's the individuals within the institution that do this. Everyone is just doing what they do. That's right, um, and. In actual fact, it, what I tried to do is express the contrary position through Gregory, where he says he was a soldier and he watched his comrade die in the cause in Northern Ireland, in a cause that you know he didn't necessarily believe in. But all the military in the, in the UK give their oath of allegiance to the crown, not to the prime minister, not to the parliament, not to any elected body, to this thing. And when it's to the crown, it could be the you know, it could be to the Queen, and then when the Queen's gone, it's the King. So it's not to an individual, yeah. it's not to a president, it's to this thing. And what he says quite passionately is that he saw his friend die. Is his friend an idiot for giving his oath to that crown? He can't think that that's the case. He doesn't want to think that's the case. Therefore, that entity he gave his allegiance to has to be beyond reproach. You know, as a soldier, that's what it has to be. It has to be non-human other than human entity that he gave his oath to and he was right to do it so i think there is a point of view that is it good that there is this thing that isn't actually about single individuals it's just this thing that's a thousand years old that hovers above you know the stresses and strains of political life and sometimes you know you look at other countries and see how a president can actually just take total control and power. And you think, well, maybe this shiny thing above does have an influence. But to be in it, to be in that spaceship, is terribly stressful, I think. And that's what happened to Diana. Yeah. And that, that uh, underlines a point that I often make with people, that it's not binary. It doesn't have to be it's all bad or it's all fantastic it's actually really complicated and I think this film yeah. does a great job of that um I also really love the way when Diana eventually mm. decides to move on um with the, 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 the there's a tonal shift it's very it's subtle but as the film progresses the film becomes more open and uh, more uh, and not so suffocating and I just can you speak to how the screenplay establishes that important tonal shift yeah, it, it, it's a sort of a gradual thing where, to, again, another gift that reality gave me was that the house where she grew up and had a happy childhood and many happy Christmases was a walk, walking distance from somewhere. Yeah. And that's the case of that. My research tells me that the place was boarded up for building work. People have said it wasn't boarded up, but actually at that time for building work, it was boarded up. So there's the 
metaphor in front of you. There's the boarded up building. That's the ghost of Christmas past, if you like. Yeah. As soon as she goes out and tries to get there, it's the first attempt to get out of the, you know, the enclosure. And there's barbed wire that stops her. The second time she uses cutters to cut the barbed wire. So that's the next bit of the escape. Then she's at the beach, more that open than anything could possibly be. Yeah. Total freedom, but still she's got to go back. She can't just run off from there because she's got to go back and get the kids. So she goes back and gets the kids. And then what I want was that she, suddenly she's back in what I would recognise as England now, you know, even though it's in the 90s. That uh, She's just driving the car. So she's driving herself, which is a statement for anybody in her position. Kids are in the back. Everybody's familiar with that. And I just wanted to have it that after all that fantastic food cooked so beautifully that she couldn't absorb, she couldn't keep. She goes, they go to a Kentucky Fried Chicken and eat that. And she can keep that. She can absorb yeah. that. You know, that, that's, the, that's the sort of the, the strategy, I suppose. Yeah, I love that. Um, it, when you see the final products or when, even in, you know, during production and post-production, what what's what do you most value about a director like Pablo Lorraine? What does he bring to the table as a collaborator on this film? He's just so brilliant, and it, he's brilliant first of all at getting the you know helping with the performance. So Kristen and Pablo together um, had this relationship that created what we see you know um, on the screen. He's, it's so beautiful, which, which should be a secondary consideration, but it's not. The, the, the way that it looks is beautiful, and that makes it, when it's scary, makes it even more scary. So it's just, you're in, in the hands of a genius, basically. Yeah. Um, and as a writer, what was so uh, unusual in this project, particularly in movies rather than television, was that what I wrote is what got shot. Yeah. It's very so unusual. Um, and as the rushes, the rushes would come back to the screen where I wrote it, and I think they come home. It's fine. It's exactly. And not only have they come home, they've come home in a form beyond belief that is so beautiful and so beautifully executed. So one would love to say this is how it always is. It's not. It's never like this. Um, and that's why I think all three of us look back and go, "What happened? You know, how did that happen?" <laughs> yeah and then of course you see Kristen's performance um, yeah absolutely it's just a revelation to me I was so skeptical like most people I being completely honest I was like this is not this can't work and it's, it's just gonna be a disaster it's gonna be a complete disaster and she was She's just incredible. What was your yeah. first reaction when you saw the rushes and then you saw first the rushes? Out? First rushes were just like, this is it. This is the, the first 10 seconds when she's, her body is doing the work of the, the way she's moving. And the first thing you think is she looks like Diana. Then the, the, the miracle is you stop thinking about it. Yeah. You stop thinking yeah. there's somebody who looks like Diana. You're in. And and she takes you in. So that is the thing. I mean, I know she went on a long journey to find the character and wow, it's, it is phenomenal. It is phenomenal. My final question is looking back to um, your Oscar nomination for Daddy Pretty Things. Um, I was a super fan of that. I love Stephen Frears. And I'm just wondering, what was your highlight from that? What, what do you recall when you think about that highlight in your career being nominated at the Academy Awards? It, it's it, it's like a very um, odd dream. It really does feel like that because for everything from the moment, you, you know, first of all, the fact of being nominated was a shock because it was my first screen play. I didn't know what the system was. I hadn't done any of this. Yeah. I hadn't done any interviews or anything because I didn't know what they were. And somebody said, you should watch the TED TV because the announcement was on there. And there it was. I was like, this is amazing. Um, and then... I mean, Leonard Cohen said, all you need to be a writer is arrogance and inexperience. <laughs> um, and I had plenty of inexperience. So uh, it was just a, an amazing event from someone coming to the hotel room to do your hair for you. And, and the disappointment on the face of the hairdresser, the fact that he's got the writer. And you can see it, it's tangible. Because <laughs> he could have got anybody, you know, and it could have been a star. And he's like, oh, Jesus, some writer from Britain. Uh, uh, exactly. 
Um, so it's like you are a member of the, as a writer, you sort of feel like a member of the public being invited to this lavish do and you know, Bill yeah. Murray's in the vinyl next to you and it's just a <laughs> mad prince wow. goes walking by. So the whole thing was, um, I was very impressed with the amount of alcohol that people from Hollywood drink at I know, Oscar right? night. When they don't drink the rest of the time, or they say that, they, but on Oscar night, it's like everything is released. It's, very, it's incredible. Is it true that you uh, enjoy the ride, you love the nomination, you're so grateful, it's all about the nomination, don't care if I win, but as soon as you're sitting in that seat and the category is about to be announced, you get that sudden like, oh, no, I think I want to win this. Like, I've heard that so many times. Is that what it was like for you? It was. It, it was a bit of both because also I thought, oh, God, if I go up there, you know, what am I going to say? What am I going to think? I didn't have anything written. <laughs> and then the last, it was almost like a mixture of both was, because I thought that I've got no chance, with, which was proven correct. Um, yeah. But I thought at that moment, I thought, well, hang on, there is a possibility. And I wow. don't know what I'm going to say. And I can't remember anybody's name. And it would be a bit of a nightmare. But yeah, it's one of those things uh, you have to uh, care and not care in equal measure. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. I think that's, that's healthier. And of course, you will always be Oscar nominated a writer, Stephen Knight. On that note, thank you for your time. Congrats on a wonderful film and good luck. This thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.